Well, I greatly appreciate the invitation to come to Rutgers for this conference on interval estimation. It's very many years since I visited Rutgers, but I have happy memories of several occasions there. And I'm sure your conference will be uh, very interesting and fruitful. I know it's about interval estimation, but I'm going to take the liberty of beginning with some more general remarks about the role of statistics in um, well, science in, in general. And we can think about this in various ways, but here's one way of going about it. Um, thinking of a series of phases of investigation, starting with the very important issue of the use of statistical methods to and statistical thinking uh, to clarify research questions. Because in any field of investigation, the asking of the right question is absolutely crucial. In a sense, it's more important to ask the right question than to uh, worry about details of the answer. So statistical thinking can help take a subject matter question and question or questions and clarify them. And that, that can be very fruitful. Uh, then, if there isn't already data to address those questions, uh, we have the whole issue of study design, design of experiments, design of observational studies, uh, sample surveys, and so forth. Uh, technically interesting, but as a, speaking purely personally, as a ap sometimes applied statistician, taking part in the planning of a large investigation can be one of the most interesting and fruitful things that one does, most challenging things that one's likely to do. Uh, then we have issues of metrology. Uh, and by metrology, I mean the principles of measuring things, of measuring um, features conveniently and accurately and reliably. And particularly, it's a term that's mostly used in, in a physical science con context, but many really major, major lines of work depend upon developing clever ways of uh, measuring things that, that are reliable and usable. And there are lo lo lots of examples of that. Um, if we move away from the natural sciences and think we can think about how to measure health-related quality of life, how many dimensions is that, does one need, how, how are reliable results to be obtained. Uh, we can think about sleep as an important and interesting issue. How should we measure sleep by um, self-assessed questionnaire? How do we take account of 15 minutes quiet sleep at the back of a lecture room, for example? It can be very rewarding. Um, and so on. So issues of metrology uh, are very important, often critical. Then we come to data collection, then to data analysis. Um, the statistical literature, the formal statistical literature, apart from that bit, those bits that are concerned with study design, the formal statistical literature is largely concentrated on data analysis, methods and theory for the analysis of data. And then we can go from uh, data analysis, which I would think of as ending with perhaps the fitting, either perhaps some purely descriptive summary of the data or the fitting of some model and uh, the uh, uh, provision of estimates and, and some indication precision, that would be the analysis of the data. The interpretation of the data would be what's its underlying scientific meaning. How does, how does the, the, the analysis of the data feed back to the, que the research questions that we started with? Or it may be a, a purely uh, an issue that's more focused on uh, decision making. It may be uh, issues such as what account should a clinician take of these results? What account should a policymaker uh, take account of these results? 
for determining what to actually do in some context. But I'm going to concentrate largely on the interpretational side. Now, that's a natural sequence to look at. But I think it's important that in real applications, uh, the sequence may be, get very distorted. That's to say uh, that one may, when collecting the data, perceive that the research question is rather poorly formulated. There may be issues that arise uh, at the data collection or certainly at the data analysis uh, side. And the extreme version of that would be when uh, some totally new and unexpected issue is only perceived when you see the data uh, totally not accounted for in the pre preliminary work that was done in setting up the study or some very strongly held belief that A is better than B is refuted by the data which seems to show that A is worse than B. What do we do about that if, the, if these uh, prior perceptions are strongly refuted are either quite different and not, not, not a, the data suggested thinking in a quite different way or our prior perceptions are strongly contradicted. And it's obviously a dangerous area, in particular caution is needed, and if at all possible, unexpected conclusions like that need independent uh, verification. But to say we won't look at this because we didn't think of it beforehand would be a very, very dangerous uh, strategy to follow. So uh, while that sequence is a natural one to think about, it's certainly, in real, real life, uh, things are likely to be more complicated. So I'm saying that the themes that I've just listed are intertwined. Uh, we may have questions formulated only after we've seen the data. Uh, that, but nevertheless, question formulation is absolutely crucial. And our analyses uh, whatever level of statistics we're using can be relatively informal. That's to say, the probability element in it, in the analysis, may be relative, either not, not present at all, it may be totally a question of, of uh, data summarization, or the, the probabilistic element may be relatively minor. Or, as the analyses get more and more formal, there's more and more emphasis on the probabilistic side. When we, when we go to the more formal models, and, and of course the statistical, the f theoretical statistical literature is overwhelmingly concentrated on, on topics where there are well, f fairly well formulated probabilistic models to describe the data, and we have to say, well, where do these models come from? Well, sometimes they come from the randomization structure of an experiment. Uh, if, we, if we've done a Latin uh, square experiment, for example, the analysis in terms of row effect, column effect, and treatment effect um, is not is really dictated to an appreciable, not totally, but to an appreciable extent by the randomization scheme that's used to set up the design. It's not a special physical or biological assumption for the particular set of data. It's normally best sort of thought of as a consequence of randomization. It may be that many, perhaps most statistical models that one sees in the, in the biological and social science area, the models are just describing plausible general patterns of variation, multiple regression in its various manifestations and generalizations, for example. Or occasionally, and most interestingly, it may be based on some special stochastic theory of the phenomenon. And infectious disease epidemiology would be an example of that, where the simple differential equations of, of epidemic model, modeling might be used to at least partially guide the formulation of an, an analysis of a specific epidemic. Now, proceeding a bit further down this chain, we have to decide 
having, if, if we're going to think about formalistic, probabilistic models, uh, they will have parameters, and we can think of uh, parameters of interest as attempts to translate a subject matter question into a formal statistical question. And I've distinguished in a fairly obvious sort of way between parameters in a model that are really of interest in their own right. They are part of an attempt to address the science of the problem. And then other, other uh, parameters may be there because they're necessary to describe uh, the pattern of variation we've got, even though they're of no particular scientific interest. In, in many, but not all cases, for instance, in any regression-like problem, the residual variance might be something that's got to be there, but we're not explicitly interested in it. Uh, whereas the regression parameters, some of them at least, are the, are the focus of our attention. Now, how are we going to tackle, coming now closer to the, the theme of, of the conference, how are we going to tackle uh, Assuming we've got as far as a probabilistic model, how are we going to tackle uh, inference about a parameter of interest? And one, one solution with a very long history used to be called inverse probability. Uh, and I think the term Bayesian, uh, statistic, Bayesian approach only came in use relatively recently. Uh, inverse probability or Bayesian solution and if that's based on a firmly established prior distribution, it's clearly the way to go. I don't think anyone can dispute that. The difficulty is, <clears throat> what, is a, what is a firmly based prior distribution? Now, the major study of that, there would be many studies, but the major study was by uh, Harold Jeffries. Uh, Jeffries was very famous initially uh, for his work in geophysics, and I think it was his, his, his analysis of the observational data of geophysics that led him to an interest in the statistical analysis of such data and, and then into the, the basic uh, ideas that were involved. And in the, uh, a book, first edition in 1939, there were um, minor revisions in later editions of the book a highly influential book, uh, he, he really developed the idea that you could have some sort of representation of an initial state of ignorance so that your analysis um, described what you could learn from the data. And he distinguished between what he called chance, which was a frequency-based representation of variability in the real world, and probability, which was a measure of uncertainty of knowledge about the world. He used, when he, in the title of his book, Theory of Probability, by probability he meant uh, assessing uncertainty, not describing haphazard variability in the real world, which as I say, he called chance. And he developed um, a theory of doing, for that, of doing that. And the answer you get for interval estimation are often, but not always, uh, very similar to those that will be got by other approaches, in particular by um, so-called frequentist approach, which didn't bring in this additional notion of probability as measuring uncertainty. But it was shown at a fairly early stage that this, although well, it's often for interval estimation gave very, very nice answers, which everybody was happy with, so to speak. Um, not so true for testing hypotheses, that's a different story. Um, although it was true for interval estimation, it could go very badly wrong. And I think this was first pointed out by Morris Bartlett in uh, the late 1930s, uh, where he showed uh, basically that if you use maximum likelihood on a problem with many parameters, you could get disastrously wrong answers. And he showed what to do to correct for that. And Charles Stein, in, in a well-known paper in the 1950s, uh, 
he, he didn't, Stein didn't discuss this in a Bayesian formulation, but a slightly different but equivalent formulation. He showed a very explicit example where the result of doing, using the flat plier prior and, and determining the posterior of a derived parameter gave absolutely disastrous results. Uh, not just by disastrous, I don't just mean that a 95% coverage was a 96% coverage. I mean that a 95% coverage was a 10 to the minus 7th probability coverage. It was just totally, utterly wrong answer. Very striking example. Now, uh, turning for, to very explicit bit of history and simple example, the first, as far as I'm aware, the first attempt to give interval estimates for parameters that were not based on posterior distributions and prior probabilities it was by R. A. Fisher in 1930 in a paper with a very mysterious and misleading title, uh, but nevertheless a very interesting paper. And he concerned himself with problems that were one parameter exponential family problems with continuous responses, or could be prob implicitly problems could, that could be reduced to that by conditioning or marginalization. And I'd, I'd describe his argument in slightly different words, by, t by taking the very simplest il illustration of that, uh, we have a random variable y that's normal with mean theta and variance 1. And we observe one observation. That's reducing the thing to the simplest form. And we, we know nothing else, just, just the model, the y is norm, capital Y, is normal with mean theta and variance 1, and that we've observed little y. Now, we can start off uh, with a statement of the model, namely that the probability in the usual sense, the capital Y, is less than theta plus some suitable constant, is equal to whatever probability we choose to have. So we start out like that. And capital Y is the value of an observation we haven't yet observed. All we know about it is that's its probability distribution. And now the situation changes. We observe that capital Y is equal to little y. And what Fisher basically said, he didn't use quite this notation, that we can just replace capital Y by little y because that's what's happened. We've observed that our random variable capital Y is equal to little y. And that our now our unknown feature is the value of theta. And I've put inverted commas around the probability at the beginning and the probability and the theta at the end. We have exactly the same statement because now nothing has happened between line one and line two except that we've observed an observation in general, like canonical statistic or whatever it might be. Fisher didn't, Fisher ju just used probability and said, well, because of that, we can say uh, that we know the distribution of the unknown capital theta. If you wanted to, you could obviously rewrite it in terms of the cumulative distribution function of the notional random variable capital theta. And he called that, I don't think in that particular, he called that the inverse probability distribution of capital theta. Later he called it the fiducial distribution of theta. And so he was saying that in a case like that, if all we have is the starting model with capital Y unknown and theta unknown, and then somebody tells us an observation, we can say in some sense that the probability, uh, we could infer the distribution of the unknown uh, parameter theta in that final statement. We can infer its distribution function and there's no prior distribution involved. He's, he's, he's conjured the Bayesian answer 
uh, without introducing a prior distribution. And later he called that the fiducial distribution of theta. Now, it seems to me, at least, that, there's, um, that that's a fairly compelling argument for saying that, yes, in that situation, uh, we can, if all we know is what I've said there, all we know is the value of our canonical statistic, and it's continuously distributed, we can infer a distribution for the parameter that's very, very like and very closely related to the original probability distribution we started with. Now, where the great majority of people think Fisher went wrong is that he went on to say, well, having done that, we can, get, <coughs> uh, we can treat uh, our notional random variables as random variables, and we can take several of these statements and combine them by the laws of probability and deduce uh, the distribution of anything we might be interested in. And it was 20 years or so later before Dennis Lindley showed that that argument won't work, although in a sense Bartlett had shown it and Charles Stein also <coughs> in, in the, the work that I mentioned uh, just previously. So that's an argument where <coughs> um, it looks as though we can make an interval statement about <coughs> an unknown parameter. Now here's an example where this runs into... Well, l l let me just say uh, that Neyman, some years later, Neyman's paper on confidence intervals was, I think, 1937. Neyman formalized the notion of interval estimation, but not in the terms that were related to the discussion I've just given. He, he would give a single confidence interval or confidence limit for a particular parameter, not a distribution. Now, <clears throat> let's think of an example, an important example, where this runs into difficulties. There's a standard linear model. Um, capital Y, J is a, um, normally distributed, let's take the simplest case, normally distributed random variables, the epsilons are um, independent normal random variables. Um, let's even suppose we know their variance, zero mean variance sigma squared. Uh, if we have to estimate the variance, that's a minor complication. There's a straight line regression. The x is a fixed constant. I've written it in the form to <coughs> produce uh, orthogonality of estimation for convenience. There's a straight line model. And we ask the question, where does the straight line hit the origin or hit some known value? At what point is the expected value of y a constant, given constant, let's say zero? Well, at zero, it's at where x minus x bar is minus alpha over beta. <coughs> now, um, we can estimate alpha and beta by least squares. They'll be independent. So we end up with a ratio of two. Uh, when we think of estimating that value, <coughs> um, we end up with a ratio of two independently normally distributed random variables. Um, and I just point out <coughs> that that example, uh, which is a re arose realistically in a bioassay context originally, it's also very strongly connected with the popular topic of Mendel Mendelian randomization and also uh, in econometrics of instrumental variable analysis, where ratios of regression coefficients are being considered. Well, now, to study the question in more detail, it's best to take it. <coughs> take it in a, um, a canonical form. So I have two random variables, independent, normal, unit variance, and unknown means, mu and nu. And I say I'm interested in the ratio of the two means. And the solution was given by Fisher in, uh, uh, he gave it to the biometrician Chester Bliss, uh, who was, uh, I think, visiting London from Yale in the 1930s and asked Fisher 
uh, posed this problem as a bioassay problem to fish, and Fisher gave the following solution. Characteristically of Fisher, uh, it was published, in, he, he was very, very general. He, he had a reputation uh, well deserved in many respects of being a very difficult person, but he was also often extremely generous with his ideas, which he would give to people for them to publish. Anyway, it's published by Bl paper by Bliss, and the argument goes like this. Um, we consider y minus theta x. <coughs> That's normal. Remember, theta is the ratio of the two means. So that's something that's got zero mean and a variance one plus theta squared. So we can say that by choice of the constants k star, we can make uh, that random variable in the middle there um, lie between two limits. We could take an upper limit and a lower limit. We're able to take the two symmetrically for a reason that will appear in a moment. Take the two symmetrically and we can make that probability whatever we want it to be by choice of the constant k. So what we have to do when we've got data, the data will be little y and little x. Just like the earlier problem I mentioned where we observe one value of our random variable. Here we're observing one value of these two things whose ratio is to be obtained. So we get little y and little x. We have to say to ourselves, what does that tell us about theta? And the solution uh, given by Fisher was to say, well, we equate <coughs> y minus theta x squared uh, over 1 plus theta squared. We take the square of the, the uh, uh, expression in the middle there and equate it to its upper and lower limits. So the values of theta are determined by the roots of the quadratic equation, which is obtained by saying that the square of the thing in the middle there is equal to k star squared. And there's that quadratic equation. Quadratic equation in theta uh, that tells us <coughs> implicitly whether the value of theta is in that limit, yes or no. Now, the solution of that, there are now essentially three possibilities. If that equation has complex roots, it turns out there are no values of theta. Sorry, if it has complex roots, every value of theta satisfies that equation. Every value of theta is in our confidence set. If it has two real roots, there are now two possibilities. Either uh, all values of theta in a certain interval satisfy the equation, or all values outside a certain interval satisfy the equation. So we end up with three possible answers. That the confidence set is everything, all possible values of theta are consistent with the data, or we may end up with what we perhaps expect, a nice little, or not so little, interval of values that are consistent with the data, or we're told every value outside a certain interval is consistent with the data. That's what the, the algebra and formalism is telling us. Now we have to, because that may seem at first sight slightly surprising, we have to say, does it make sense from a common sense? Because if, if, if the theory gives us an answer that seems very surprising to our common sense, either our common sense is wrong or the theory is wrong, then we have to find out which. Well, the way to do that is to look at simple special cases. The point is that in general, you see, that inference is not in general in the form of a distribution. This is why I'm going over this example because in, some, in easier cases, the form of the inference about theta is in effect a distribution. But here's a case where it seems not to be a distribution. Well, here are three little examples. Remember, these are observations on normals with variance 1. So we can say the numerator is somewhere between 98, 99, 100, something of that sort. The denominator is 48, 49, 50, perhaps. 
the ratio is pretty close to two, and it's not going to depart very much from two, and a confidence, uh, whatever you care to call it, a confidence interval or whatever, uh, around the, the point estimate two is perfectly reasonable. It'd be surprising to find anything else. So that's perfectly well behaved, and that's one possible solution. But now think of the following. Remember, x is a value of the denominator, not the numerator. Well, the numerator's okay. It's right, going to be pretty close to 100. The denominator, well, it's got an error of standard deviation of 1. Well, it could be 2 or 3 even. But it could be very close to 0. And it also perfectly possibly could be negative. Those are consistent with the data. And what that's saying is small values of the ratio are inconsistent with the data. Large, any arbitrary, any large value of the, of the ratio is consistent with the data, but also any large sum, uh, sorry, any sufficiently large negative value of the ratio is consistent with the data, because it might be that while the mean of y is roughly 100, the mean of x is actually minus 0.1 or minus 0.2 or whatever, totally consistent with the data. So if the intervals are about what values of the parameter are consistent with the data, in that situation, the answer that it's the outside of an interval is uh, almost inevitably the right one. And here's, a, the, in a sense, the worst case, this is the one where um, either numerator or denominator might be zero. And so the value could be very large and positive, very large and negative, very close to zero. And whatever value of the ratio you suggest, uh, it'd be impossible to refute it from this, from this data. So the, the answer that's come out of the theory that you've got these three qualitatively different answers is uh, the rational one. Is the example artificial? Well, no, not really. Um, and it's interesting that <coughs> it, it raised serious issues for Neyman's formulation of confidence intervals. Now, I heard uh, one always called him Mr. Neyman. I heard Mr. Neyman speak uh, quite a number of times, and I think uh, my memory might be quite slightly wrong, but I think the last time I heard him it was about this very issue because it troubled him you see if if when you do confidence intervals what you're doing is saying uh, you do this you do this you do repeatedly do follow a rule of action what's sometimes called a behavioristic interpretation of confidence intervals if when you do this again and again you have to be right 90 for 95 percent of the time which is one formulation that you find in both testing and interval estimation, uh, you want to follow a rule of action that will be right 95% or whatever of time. Leading to the well-known definition of a statistician, who's, who's as someone whose aim in life is to make sure that exactly 5% of everything they do is wrong. Um, now, for Neyman's theory, of confidence interval. This is, an, uh, this is a serious problem and, uh, which he was concerned about because when you put down, take the third case where your interval is the whole real line, you're making a statement that's certainly true. But you want to think of this as embedded in a long sequence of such statements, 95% of which say are true. But if you can see this statement's certainly true, it must mean when you make a non-degenerate statement, less than 95% of them are true. And Neyman was concerned uh, as to what to do about that. But it seems to me that this is at the heart of a misconception about <clears throat> the nature of many forms of statistical analysis and interval estimation in particular. And that's the distinction between calibration and action. What we're doing when we say 
If we do this again and again, we'd be wrong 95% of the time, or whatever. We're calibrating our method of measuring uncertainty against a hypothetical uh, set of procedures. We're saying the empirical meaning of, of this statement would be this. The parallel might be this. If I want to measure my height, or have my height measured reasonably accurately, there are standard protocols for doing this. I should take my shoes off, I should stand in a certain way, and, and measurements would be, be taken. If somebody says, uh, whether it's measured in metric or uh, US units, uh, whichever, um, Somebody said, well, what does that value really, what does um, so many, whatever, two metres, something or other, or, or, or five feet ten, what, do, what, does, what does this actually mean? Uh, then the answer would be, well, you're being compared with a reference method of measuring length. In modern days, I think the radio, some wavelength of some radiation or other. Uh, in the old days, you're being compared with a standard bar held <coughs> either in Washington DC or in, in Paris, as the case may be. You're comparing your length with that standard bar. If somebody, uh, if somebody asks you what your measurement really means, that's, that's, that's a kind of objective definition. And if the measurement protocol is is obeyed sufficiently accurately, you'll be pretty close to that answer. And what the, what, the, what the calibration does is to ensure that different measurements of my height, different measurements of your, different people's height, uh, more or less independently of who makes the measurements, are comparable with one another. So that calibrates the method of measuring height. It's not an instruction of how to actually do it. It explains what the measurement means. And I think there's a distinction here. If we think of confidence intervals or whatever as measuring uncertainty, this notion of repeated coverage calibrates what we're doing. It's not an instruction of how we should use it. And it's interesting, I think, uh, I mean, I haven't, one would want to make a more detailed study of this, but if one looks at, uh, at Neyman's more applied work, that tends to be how he used confidence intervals. When he lectured about them as a theoretician, it was very much, it's a rule of behavior, we must do this again and again, we can say nothing about any individual case, we're just following a behavioristic rule that has certain well-defined properties. But when he analyzed data, he, didn't, he was much more flexible and, and nearer to uh, the um, approach I, I'm suggesting where the, the method, is, the idea is to, is to um, measure uncertainty and have that measure of uncertainty calibrated by a defined procedure. And of course, the defined procedure depends upon certain assumptions, just as the defined procedure for measuring height depends upon the assumptions that the protocol me of measurement has been reasonably well followed. Now, many of these issues were discussed uh, by Uh, several people a long time ago at a meeting with the Royal Statistical Society uh, and Fisher, Neyman, Bartlett and others took part in the discussion of these papers and, and some of the points that I've been making, uh, well, perhaps many of them are taken there, and I'd particularly point out a recent paper by Don Fraser which emphasises uh, the differences between in particular the Bayesian view and the uh, uh, this other approach.
Now here's a, here's a quite different problem where interval, uh, interval estimation uh, doesn't seem to be appropriate. This is not a time series problem, this is a problem of regression with the sinusoidal fluctuation in with a series of possibly peculiarly spaced uh, values of x. So you're looking at perhaps one uh, or two fluctuations of a sine wave of unknown wavelength 2 pi over omega and uh, it may be that uh, the data if you have a poor choice of the x's that the data are consistent with values of omega in this range or values of omega in that range so your natural confidence region so to speak is a set of disjoint intervals not uh, an interval or a distribution. If I could summarize the first part of what I said, <clears throat> the formulation of incisive and relevant questions is absolutely central to any statistical analysis. Assessing the uncertainty of our answers is one, of, is one characteristic of statistical analysis. And as I've described it, is in a sense a problem of metrology. Metrology is about how do we measure things in a, in a reliable and sound way. How do we measure uncertainty in a reliable and sound way? And we ask the question, if, it's going, if, it's, if you think about measuring uncertainty like that, are our measures well calibrated? And that has to mean uh, something like a some kind of property of the method that would obtain if it were repeated but we have to be careful about what that means and an issue I haven't had time to discuss at all but perhaps more important than any of these are errors particularly in complex problems with uh, let's say big data one has to mention one can't possibly speak without mentioning the magic words big data so I, I, I've done that especially with big data are our uncertainty uh, uh, assessments based on realistic assumptions about the, the pattern of variability that are present or are we making in particular strong implicit independence assumptions which means that our standard errors are likely to be much much too small I haven't said anything about decision analysis partly because <coughs> a, a decision version of interval estimation is possible uh, but in applications I think very rare uh, if, if, if one had to, uh, uh, problems of, of position finding trying to search for an unknown point in, in, along the line or in an area that could be formulated occasionally as an interval estimation, an interval decision problem. But I think that's rather rare. So that was summary A. Summary B is this. Very often, but not always, inference about a single parameter, theta, is conveniently captured in something that looks like a formal distribution for theta. In many but not all problems, a posterior distribution <coughs> with a flat prior, a Jeffries-like prior, for example, leads to an appealing, reasonably well calibrated, and very often from a computational point of view, and even conceptual point of view, very appealing. Very often, but not always. Because, as I've stressed in the example, uh, the Bayesian solution of that kind may go very badly wrong. In particular, therefore, a uh, punchline in a sense, sometimes such a Bayesian solution would be very poorly calibrated, and in that case, it would be dangerous to use it. Thank you.